and verses of Matthew 5. The rules for Christian living in 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning with verse 14. Some of the great passages in Colossians 3 of things were to put on and things were to put off, and how they deal with internal as well as external matters. And we announced last night that we would study Romans 12 tonight and perhaps get to another part of the Bible, but I'm not sure that we can. But turn to Romans 12, please. My mother was asked to memorize this shortly after she became a Christian. Many, many years ago, Brother T.B. Larimore came to my hometown of Sherman, Texas, long before it was my hometown, and preached in a very famous six months meeting. Over 200 people were baptized into Christ. It's toward the end of the last century. In the number that were baptized was my grandmother, my mother's mother. And uh, it was a very zealous congregation from the beginning because most of these people had left denominationalism. And they didn't have any more sense than to make assignments in Bible classes. What a heresy. And she was asked to memorize chapter 12. All of them were. And she made her goal to do so. And late in her life, she could still remember this chapter. And she told me once or twice, nothing probably had done her more good in striving to live the Christian life than to commit to memory the great teachings of Romans 12. But do you notice how it begins, I beseech you, therefore, brethren? Therefore is a hinge word, a word that ties together what is preceded with that which follows. And there's no way you can appreciate the depth and intensity of Romans 12 unless you go back to verse 33 of chapter 11 as we know it. The Bible wasn't divided in chapter and verses by the Holy Spirit. Sixteen centuries went by before that was done. And I'm glad it was done, but the one sad thing about it is some people believe a new thought always begins at the first of a chapter and the last word of the previous chapter closes a thought. But the therefore of chapter 12 proves that isn't true. On the basis of what I've just said, I beseech you, it would be a natural thing for you to do. It would be the logical spiritual response for you to do, to present your body as a living sacrifice and be not conformed to this world. Well, what is it? <coughs> oh, the depth of the riches. Notice verse 33 of chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it should be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. On the basis of that, the exaltation of God, the beneficent, benevolent hand of God, the blessings he bestows upon us, it's as natural as breathing that we respond in reciprocal love and present our bodies a living sacrifice, not an old dead animal sacrifice, a la the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, but a living sacrifice. The book of Hebrews, chapter 9 particularly, and the first 11 or 12 verses of chapter 10 bring this out even more. But on the basis of the unfathomed, immeasurable generosity of the love of God, we're besought to present our bodies a living sacrifice, Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Some translations say your spiritual service. Reasonable service means it proceeds from the reasoning faculty of man. Christianity is not basically an emotional spasm. It is a reasonable, spiritual religion. Christ is the author of it. He doesn't demand of, that which, of us that which is impossible. It's even called the common salvation in Jude verse 3. And all men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross, and the demands of the gospel system, the Christian life, are not beyond our reach. It's down to earth. It's practical. It's every day. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9, 23. But I really believe verse 2 is the pivotal factor in this chapter. And every verse, every chapter has a major verse in it. And every book has a major verse in it. And most of the books have a major word in them. And I would suggest that if we'd learn to read our Bibles out loud, we'd come across that word because we'd both see it and hear it as it came in swift profusion. I, I don't know of anything that would help personal Bible study more than for us to do more reading out loud. My mother read to her three children out loud, and I'm glad she did. I learned a lot that way. 
Be not conformed to this world. Don't match the mold or pattern of the world. You shouldn't fit into the mold or pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I never shall forget the first time I learned that that word transform comes from the word we use for metamorphosis, the drastic change from the ugly caterpillar into the beautiful butterfly. Let there be as much difference in you now and the way you were before Christianity as there is in a caterpillar and a butterfly. But it's by the renewal of your mind. And you don't match the mold of the world, but you're transformed. You get out of that cocoon of error and worldliness into the beautiful sunlight of God's love. And then he discusses for several verses that the body of Christ has many members. It's parallel, though much briefer, than 1 Corinthians 12. And how that we each play a vital part in the body of Christ, and we should not look down our noses at those with lesser abilities, one talent man, two talent man, five talent, but each one do the best he can with what he's got. That's what God demands. And thus make the body of Christ complete and whole. Don't shirk in your responsibility. I believe that several of the passages in there deal with the miraculous age of the church. But the principle is still the same. Every single member of a congregation is important, just like every link in a chain is. And that's why church discipline is not just vital, it's essential. We can't allow the way of redemption to be weakened by a link in the chain that's immoral. But a lot of brethren act like they never thought of that. A preacher, a friend of mine, told of this experience in his life. He went to a congregation. I started to name the town, but that's probably where every one of you were born. But it was over in East Texas, about 175 miles from here. On interstate, you guess. But uh, he talked with the brethren all one Sunday afternoon about coming to preach with them. He said, I need to talk with you about one last thing, church discipline. One of the elders said, we have never, nor shall we ever, engage in church discipline here. He said, I'll have to look for honest brethren to work with then. i tell you the sad thing is, though, you'd have to look a long time to find many churches in the world that claim to be churches of Christ that practice church discipline consistently. And so we contaminate and weaken the body of Christ. We act like we're in charge, that we're the head of the church instead of Christ. And though he, through his ambassador, says, keep the church pure, we say we're not going to do it. Why? Well, we need the contribution money they put in the plate, or we need numbers, or some of those people need to be withdrawn from or famous in our community. And so we let the body of Christ go begging. One of these days, we'll give answer, and in Hebrews 13, we read that elders, Hebrews 13, 17, will give answer for our souls. To me, that's the most demanding, challenging thing that an elder has to consider and contemplate. Am I willing to engage in the necessary work that it takes to keep the body of Christ pure in view of the fact of, in some way, to some extent, answering for the souls of those under my oversight? Notice in verse 8, Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, don't have much of that anymore either, do we? Hebrews 3.13 tells Christians to exhort one another every day, lest any be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Do you know anybody that exhorts every single day somebody? Do you know very many members of the church you're a part of that exhort someone every day? I guarantee you something. Every congregation has somebody that needs to be exhorted every day. But we don't find many people that can exhort or be exhorted. Our feelings are on our sleeves, and we'd rather our neighbors and our weak brethren go to hell in a good humor than to exhort them about the exceeding sinfulness of sin. We let them be hardened in sin and die on the vine because we don't obey this. Now he does say, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, and that's one of the key words of Christianity. I preach Sunday morning on how practical Christianity is. It's launching this series. <clears throat> the simplicity that is in Christ, 2 Corinthians eleven three. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, or it's where to use hospitality without grudging, 1 Peter 4, 9. And though it's an old story, it fits here perfectly of the woman on a very hot summer day who worked over a 
pot stove preparing supper for the elders and their wives and the preacher and his wife. And it was a terribly hot day. And when everybody got there that night, she said to her five-year-old son, Jimmy, would you lead the prayer? And he said, I don't know what to say. She said, say something you've heard me say. That was a mistake. He said, Lord, why did we invite these people here on this hot day? I imagine some of that pie kind of choked down. With cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation. And, of course, that word means hypocrisy. And the greatest example of hypocrisy or dissimulation you'll ever read about is in Galatians 2, where Peter was such a hypocrite, he even caused good old Barnabas to dissimulate, to be a hypocrite also. When he withdrew from the Gentiles with whom he was having association, when those from James, the Jews from Jerusalem, came down to his region. And Paul said, I rebuked him to his face, for he was to be blamed. He walked not uprightly according to the gospel. Of all the sins that Jesus condemned most fervently and passionately, the sin of hypocrisy was number one. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And in Luke 12, 1, he identifies the leaven of the Pharisees as hypocrisy. To play a part as an actor on a stage, not genuine. <coughs> Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor, despise, be repulsed by that which is evil, and cleave, fasten on to that which is good. I'm afraid that's a verse that's definitely overlooked. In Numbers chapter 16, Korah and 250 cohorts perished when the ground opened up and swallowed them alive because they rebelled against God, and anyone who got near to the infamy of Korah died with him. They didn't cleave to that which is good, they were hard and fast to the one who was in rebellion. And in 2 Timothy 2.19, and we quoted that verse tonight in the sermon, that him that name of the name of Christ depart from iniquity, if you read the whole context, you'll see some references back to number 16. We don't see how close to evil we can come. We run to the other side and hug the bank of righteousness. But now beginning with verse 10 is the free-flowing application of everyday Christianity. There is no way that we can read 10 through 21 and come away unimpressed with how practical and down to earth and challenging and demanding the Christian life is. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. I've seen members of the church treat their dogs with greater gentleness and kindness than they do their brethren. Sometimes we can be vicious. Remember the story of the little boy who came home from school one day and when he got to his front gate and the wire mesh fence, his favorite thing in the world, his little puppy, had been caught there for several hours with his paws. And if you've ever seen a dog in such a position, it really is sad. Well, he rushed over there to pull him out, and the dog was so frightened he bit the boy. Did the boy get a ball bat and kill him? No, he went to the back of the fence and pulled him out that way. Why? He loved him. He was kindly affection toward him. But we don't have that camaraderie sometimes even in the body of Christ. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. That doesn't mean we overlook error. Not talking about that. But be kindly affection one to another. In fact, in Titus 3, when he said a man that's an heretic after the first or second admonition reject, but he said, now don't treat him as an enemy, but then treat him as a brother. You've marked him. You've rebuked him. But let him know the way back home is still open. And you'd welcome him gladly if he repented. Sometimes we, if we differ, it never ceases to amaze me that if brethren differ on any point, even if it's an honest difference, and difference based on conviction, the response may be, well, you're an anti or you're a liberal. Is it possible that we could disagree honestly with one another and not be either one of those? Is it possible that we really have a conviction and we're not trying to be mean and ugly? And that we haven't listed 40 things and crossed every T and dotted every I, but we Think on each matter with conviction and honesty. But many times, instead of being kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, we're like those mentioned in Proverbs 6, in that statement in verses 16 to 19 of seven thing God, things God hates and abominates. Five of those seven have to do with the way we talk to one another and treat one another and think about one another. Now one more time. You can be ever so kindly affection to one another in brotherly love and still point out error. And in fact, if you are, we've already mentioned discipline. If the person is in error biblically, we don't really love him unless we correct him or strive to teach him the truth and plead with him. But we do need to manifest a spirit of brotherly love. 
in honor preferring one another. And that's very difficult because we're so ego-centered and we think we're number one in honor preferring one another. <laughs> there are not many people in life who consistently obey that injunction. When you find a person who really honors and preferring one another, you found a rare bird. When we sometimes have our meals together, it's very, very interesting to study human nature. Several years ago, an older lady said that she noticed that every time there was a dinner among brethren that the preacher always crowded in line first. Well, after that, I determined I'd never, ever do that again. And now I'm third. <laughs> but now let's get serious. I've noticed when 200 people will eat together from this congregation, there are about 10 who get there early to prepare for everybody else. They do the dirty work. And they don't eat until everybody else. They ought to be hungry than anybody. They don't eat until everybody else is eating. And then they stay afterwards to clean up the mess that everybody else made that didn't help them to start with. I ought to take pictures of people like that. They're the real heroes of unselfishness. I know in honor preferring one another goes deeper than that, but that's just an illustration. There are not many servants, too many chiefs and not enough braves, the old Western writer said. Not slothful in business, whereas don't be lazy. Second Thessalonians 3.10 said, if a man won't work, don't let him eat. Not slothful in business. There's nothing worse than a lazy person who claims to be a Christian. And I'm not trying to be unkind, just telling the truth. Some of the laziest people I've ever met are preachers. That's just telling the truth. They never prepare anything. They're, the articles in their bulletin are always by Brother Anonymous and Sister Selected. They haven't written an article in 37 years. Though they had hours and hours and hours to study the Bible and to produce something that would challenge people to be saved. We really do need to think about that, all of us. <coughs> Not slowful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And that's the end object, serving the Lord. Jesus said he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for all. Mark 10, 45. Rejoicing in hope. Let's give a few references on the word hope. I believe that's another subject we don't preach enough on. Rejoicing in hope. Titus 1, verse 2 is probably the most famous. In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. Hope to the end for the grace that be real unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, 13. We have this hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, that we too will enter into the veil, the Holy of Holies, where Christ our forerunner is gone, Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. The beautiful entreaty and exhortation of Romans 15, 13. We're saved by hope, Romans 8, 24. Many, many great and eloquent passages on hope, and where would we be without that undergirding? Jesus said, in this life you'll receive a hundredfold, and in the world to come, eternal life. He points them in hope to the world to come, Mark 10, verse 30. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. The phrase there that's just absolutely unknown to modern-day members of the church is patient in tribulation. We don't want some of that. And we've arranged a beautiful inner sanctum, cloistered wall, religiosity that doesn't have much in common with the persecuted saints of the first century. Acts 14.22 says, With much tribulation you enter the kingdom. Romans 5 begins in verse 1 and goes through verse 5, telling us of the tribulation that is a natural outpouring of our relationship to God when we receive the system of faith through the gospel of Christ, and are undergirded by the grace of God. Patient in tribulation. We're not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. Philippians 1, 29. I stand in jeopardy every hour. 1 Corinthians 15, 29 to 31. Continuing instant in prayer. Pray without ceasing. We noticed last night. Have a prayerful disposition at all times. Lead a life that's not contrary to the prayer you pray. Men ought always to pray and never to faint. Luke 18, 1. And then Jesus gave a story of two men who prayed, and one prayed in vain because it was self-centered. And the other prayed humbly, and it was heard and blessed. 
In James chapter 4, he said, do you know why you're not receiving anything for the Lord, of the Lord? First, some of you don't ask. And then others who do ask, ask amiss to consume it on their own lusts. My favorite verse on prayer in the Bible is 1 John 5, 14. I believe it's even stronger than ask, seek, knock of Matthew 7. Christians are told then and now, this is the confidence we have in him if we ask anything according to his will. He heareth us. We ought to commit that to memory and never forget it. 1 John 5, 14. Whatsoever we ask, we receive because... We keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. 1 John 3, 22. And some people who aren't a 32nd cousin of a New Testament Christian fuss at God for not answering their prayers when they have met the priorities and prerequisites of the kind of prayer and the kind of person whose prayers will be answered. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Galatians 6, 10. As have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Acts 6, they distributed to the necessity of the saints and even some who were complaining in the daily administration of the widows, the Grecian widows. Distributing to the necessity of saints. And you can't do that without money. I love what Barnabas did. He had land and he sold it and laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet to make distribution to the saints. The end of Acts chapter 4. Good old Barnabas, the son of consolation, encouragement, exhortation, was generous in his giving too. Given to hospitality. It's as natural as it can be, and that's another qualification of an elder. Given to hospitality. It's not something he dreads to do, doesn't really engage in, doesn't want to. It's something that is natural with him. He's given to hospitality. Like a worldly man may be given to cursing. This spiritual man is given to hospitality. Some are given to selfishness. This Christian is given to hospitality. And hospitality is exercised in different ways. There's not just one certain kind of hospitality. And I mean by that that a person, I know a man, I'll, I'll just give this an illustration. I wish I could call his name, but it'd embarrass him. But he's one of the finest men I know anywhere, and he's an elder. He and his wife work probably more hours a week than any family I know and they have only one reason for working that hard. They have a tremendous business and have had it for about 30 years. I don't believe there's any family on earth that gives any more the cause of Christ year after year after year after year than they. Because of the long hours they work, realizing they're better able to do that to contribute the work of the Lord, they don't do some of the things that other people believe you must do to be hospitable. But they've probably provided the support for 50 gospel preachers in difficult fields around them. And they don't just send a check. The woman writes long letters of encouragement. I believe that's hospitality. I get tired of brethren who think the only way you can have hospitality is a certain way. But hospitality is a part of Christianity. Verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Bless them which persecute you. Truth standing on its head to gain attention. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. Say, all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecute they the prophets which were before you. The closing beatitude, the one that's often overlooked and dropped, because we can't comprehend that. Blessed means happy. How can you be happy when you're persecuted? And on top of that, how can you bless those who persecute you? First Timothy 2, written to Christians, persecuted by the Roman Caesars, they were commanded to pray for the rulers. Pray for the very rulers who imprisoned them and would put them to death. Pray for them. I do note that in many of our public prayers concerning the problems in the Middle East, we often only pray for our rulers and our boys. I believe the Bible teaches we pray for all the rulers of all the world because we believe God rules in the kingdoms of men. Daniel 4.25 I'll tell you one thing. There are a lot of world rulers that need a lot of prayers. And they're not all over the pond. We've got some state senators and legislators and a new governor in this state that's for the state lottery and we need to really pray for her. I can't think of anything that's going to hurt the state of Texas more than open gambling. We've already got enough wives and children bereft of a paycheck 
because of husbands and fathers that gamble away the check before they get home with a loaf of bread. And then she steps up and says, I'm poor of the lottery. She had lived in Florida when we did and saw what happened there when they started the lottery. I just guarantee you there'll be about 50 more deaths a year in the state of Texas if it goes through. And don't tell how many hundreds of women and children are going to be in bad shape. So we need to pray for rulers on every level. And then be sure our life is such that we can blend into society some godliness, some spirituality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. That's why I know the Bible came from God. It has a higher ethic than any book, any human being, uninspired of God would write. What uninspired person would say, bless those that curse you, pray for your enemies, do good to those who despitefully use you. If your enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirsts, give him drink. The higher moral code and ethic of the Bible proves it came from an eternal, infinite, infinite mind. And those people who think that every time God looks down from heaven, he sees white, southwestern Americans, red, white, and blue, and a democracy and a republic, or a republic and a democracy, whichever way I'm supposed to say that, better reread the Bible. He sent his son as the one who died for all. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. And of one blood he made all nations to dwell upon the face of the earth, Acts 17. And all men stand on level ground to foot the cross, and he is no respecter of persons. Romans 2, 11. We need to pray for all the rulers. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. And I definitely believe the harder part of that tandem is the first. I believe it's a lot harder to rejoice with those that do rejoice than to weep with those who weep. I know some people that the minute someone starts telling something sad, before they even get the punchline, the other person who is hearing them is already crying. They don't know what they're crying about. But it's kind of hard to find folk who rejoice with those who do rejoice. Because we're selfish. We're envious. We're jealous. And envy is the rottenness of the bones, Proverbs 14.30. And in Mark 15.10, Pilate said he knew that for envy the people delivered Jesus to him. Rejoicing with those who do rejoice is not easy. Christianity is on a higher level. The standard is way up yonder on a mountain, and we dare not bring it down to our level, but get us up there where the standard is with the captain of our salvation, even Christ, Hebrews 2.10. Be of the same mind one toward another, but incidentally weep with them that weep. I need to mention this. It isn't wrong to weep. Jesus wept, and he was perfect, John 11.35. And 1 Thessalonians 4 does not tell Christians not to weep. It says don't sorrow like those of the world who sorrow, who have no hope. I've shed some tears this year. My mother's died. A lady told me yesterday. And as far as I know, I'd never seen her before. She said, when we lived in Abilene years ago, I was in the hospital for a good while. And every single day, your mother sent me a get well card. I'm thankful she told me that. I've shed some tears. I helped preach my mother's funeral. I watched as they put the casket down in that ground. I wept unashamedly. And I've wept since. We've had a tragedy in our family in the other months of this year. Some deaths, some injuries, some loss, some sorrow. We've, we've cried. I shed some tears yesterday reflecting on some of this. But it wasn't a tear without a hope in it. <laughs> weep with those that weep. And one more time, as I did when we began our sermon tonight, I thank you for weeping with us. I told Brother Jimmy Reeves, a good friend of mine for many years that I visited with before the preaching service tonight, don't let anyone ever doubt the love of fellow Christians. If anyone wonders if Christianity is genuine and real and brethren really love one another, send them to me. I'll show them those four or five hundred cards we got and tell them of the two hundred long-distance phone calls we got and the hundreds of people that came to see us and then beyond that, people who provided <laughs> food and money and helping with the children. And, and to this day, brethren are still helping. That's been four months ago. Weep with those that weep. That's an inherent part of Christianity. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. It's so easy to be materialistic. 
It's so easy to think we're somebody because we finally have a pair of shoes we bought ourselves. See, I grew up in the Depression. Some people say I started. I was born in 1930. I know this. It lasted our house about 10 years longer than anybody else's. It hadn't been those hand-me-down clothes. I guess we'd really been in bad trouble when we walked those four miles to the country school that my wife and I mapped out about five years ago. And it, you know, it was just a mile and a quarter. I don't know what happened to those other three miles. <laughs> But I was grateful for my double cousin in Muskogee, Oklahoma, that sent me some boots that you could strap up to the knees. I didn't freeze on that 10-mile walk. But uh, mind not high things, but condescend <laughs> to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. It's so easy to become arrogant. You ever made the statement, I can't understand why that person is arrogant. They don't have anything to be arrogant about. Well, none of us has anything to be arrogant about. After we've done everything the Lord told us to do, we're to say we're unprofitable servants. Luke 17, 10. We've done that which was our duty to do. Be not wise in your own conceits. Remember the story of the man who said, I only made one mistake in my life. And that's the day I thought I was wrong. But later I learned I was right. And that's the only mistake I've ever made. Be not wise in your own conceits. That's sort of like the man and woman said, we've been married 60 years and never had an argument. Somebody's not telling the truth. <laughs> Somebody doesn't understand an argument when they see one. And then number three, I feel sorry for those people how dull their life has been. If Iris and I don't have at least one good argument a day, we've, we've wasted the time. Keep hoping she'll win one of them someday, but... <laughs> I don't know why I'm always right. It's the strangest thing in the world. Be not wise in your own conceits. I'll have a long-distance call from my daddy-in-law when I get home. Some of you tattletales will get on the phone to tell them, recompense to no man evil for evil. Now, that's hard. A lot of people train their children. If that punk at school hits you, hit him back. Hit him harder. Knock him down. If he gives you one black eye, bloody his nose and black both eyes. I've got a real challenge now. You got a little one-year-old granddaughter that we keep about five out of seven days and nights. First of all, she's done a number on me, and I apologize for making fun of grandparents who spoil their kid. I'm going to have to hire somebody to come spank her. I don't know what. But, <laughs> but she'll start out with forgetting this principle in hurry. When she rubs my head, she beats on it and pats me like that. And then before I know it, she's grabbed that nose and twisted it like that. No little old fingers are sharp and... She's going to be a lady wrestler if I don't do something with her. <laughs> Recompense an old man evil for evil. Her four and five-year-old brother is already afraid of her. We've got to teach her this passage right here. Recompense to no brother evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Now I'm going to get real serious. I believe that that is a command that we have overlooked. We must provide things honest in the sight of all men. I heard a man who was a treasurer in a congregation one time. He said, the elders asked me to count this money, and I'm going to take it home with me, and I'm going to count it by myself. And if anybody questions me, they can just have it. Don't believe he had read this verse. Then there are brethren who don't provide a financial statement. I don't believe that's providing things honest inside of all men. I went to work with a congregation once. Stayed there five years, but the first year is the hardest one I ever saw. They hadn't had a financial statement in 10 or 11 years. And one elder and one secretary had the entire budget, contribution, balance, expenditures, either in her purse or his hip pocket. 200 people had left that congregation. I understand why. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. But that's not the only way that applies. People who sneak around instead of just open and above board. People that you can never get a straight answer out of. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as it depends upon you, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. It's well known that I take the view of can a Christian kill for his government or anyone else with an absolute no. 
I might be called a pacifist, I don't know, but but the point is I take that position because of this passage, if nothing else. And it always amazed me that people go to chapter 13 after he said, if your enemy hunger, feed him, if you thirst, give him drink, and as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men, and turn chapter 13 into a warmonger approach. But the point is, live peaceably with all men. And I'm often asked, preacher, if everybody believed what you believed about warfare, what would happen to the world? Well, we'd never have any more wars. Everybody believed that. How can I be a follower of the Prince of Peace and be a man of war? How can I willfully take the life of someone when I'm on earth to save souls, not kill lives? Someone says, but Christianity will be destroyed. Well, what a wonderful way to die. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Revelation 14, 13. Be at peace with all men. How would you like to have been the Christian in the first century in the Roman Empire that killed the Apostle Paul at the command of Nero Caesar? How would you like to be a Christian who kills another Christian on the battlefield because he's from one country and you're from another? But that'd be better than killing a non-Christian because if you kill a Christian, at least he has hope of eternal life. So when you figure out and ferret out all these points and read this passage, how can I apply, as much as it depends upon me, be at peace with all men, and if you enemy hunger, feed him, if you thirst, give him drink? We started answering that last Wednesday night in our midweek services here on questions and answers that we've been having for several months, and I'm not naive enough to think that I've satisfied everybody and that there won't be other questions attendant to it. But I'll still answer what I believe the Bible says. And I'll tell you another thing. You can't answer that question at a more unpopular time than right now. But it was asked, and I hadn't got enough sense to dodge it. At least let's think about it. As much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, isn't that a beautiful expression? That's not found many times in the Bible. In the midst of Hebrews 6, where he's talking about impossible to renew them again to repentance, right in the midst of one of the sternest contexts of the Bible, he says, but beloved, and that's the only time he uses that word in that whole book. What a strategic time to use it. Dearly beloved, see how the Holy Spirit inspires the writing of God's word. The punch comes at the right time. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's a quote from Deuteronomy 32, 35. And in the book of Jude, the archangel said to the enemy of God, Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. Words, he even left vengeance, though he was archangel, in the hand of God who deals with vengeance. And we need to do that too. If you believe that God rules in the kingdoms of men, Daniel 4.25, and that there is a God in heaven, Daniel 2.28, he'll take care of these matters. Who would ever have thought in the height of World War II that there'd ever be any New Testament Christians in Hitler's Germany? But I preached one night in West Berlin to one of the most ardent, zealous congregations, and that was 17 years after the treaty had been signed. And I met some of the greatest Christians I've ever known, See, God rules in the kingdoms of men, and war is terrible and tragic. But out of that, the infinite, eternal God, who does all things well, can see the fruit of the gospel in the lives of those who once had followed a maniac. Three more minutes. Three more minutes. Thank you. Now that's before we start the second hour. <laughs> Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know, that releases us from reciprocal action, from retaliation. First Peter 2 said, When Jesus was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was threatened, he threatened not. And we're to follow his steps. He's the bishop and shepherd of our souls. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. And then get a ball bat and knock his brains out. No, I didn't know what that says. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, and remember each one of us shall give account of himself unto God, the United States government won't answer for me in the day of judgment. My employer will not 
answer for me in the day of judgment. I'll answer for the deeds I have done in my own body. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And when you run the references in Proverbs and elsewhere in the book of Leviticus concerning that, I believe he's simply saying, you'll make him think. He'll never forget that instead of retaliating in kind, you were kind to him. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Evil can be overcome, not with evil in retaliation, but with good, what God calls good. Tomorrow night, the book of James, Lord willing, and the last night, First and Second Peter, on everyday Christianity.